Welcome to Seat at the Table. I'm your host, Munson Steed, and I am joined by one of the favorites of change makers, social change agents, a true leader in the movement. When you think of social justice, when you think of economic justice, and when you think of just justice for all. She hails from the initials MSP. For all of you who think of George Floyd, even think before George Floyd, for the loss of black life is not new to the MSP. There is a racial justice network and I have today, Akima Armstrong. I am so proud to see you again, sister. How are you? And welcome to A Seat at the Table. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm just trying to grapple with all the things that have unfolded here in the Twin Cities at the start of 2022. Um, it's, it's a lot that's been going on here, but we're just continuing to do our best to stand strong and stand firm and to continue to fight for justice. When you think of race, racial justice and uh, an organizer like yourself, what are the two characteristics you, you would suggest to young people who want to stay in this movement, the Black movement, the justice movement? What should they know that there are two characteristics that they're going to have to have? Well, I would say one of the first characteristics is to know and learn Black history. Now, our history is so vast and so expansive, but we should at least understand what happened during the um, era of slavery and looking at those who resisted in particular to try to draw some strength and courage from those individuals who fought against oppression. And then looking at, um, the, the Jim Crow era and the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, the Black Power movement, all of those things are precursors to the Black Lives Matter movement. So that young folks understand that this movement that we're in the midst of didn't start from scratch. We're standing on the shoulders of the people who came before us and who fought against and who resisted oppression. So knowing your history is number one. And then I would say the second thing that young folks would need to know is the power of commitment. It takes um, a desire for, for change, for transformation, and to understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint to be committed to the cause of fighting for justice for uh, black folks um, in this country in particular. And so knowledge of history and commitment are two of the key most important things that I think a young person needs to engage in this struggle. When, when you think of Dr. Martin Luther King, and obviously um, we have an idea of who he is, how do you put your Dr. Martin Luther King on? Uh, and how does he walk with you when you are in your moments of not only just confrontation, but meditative to understand that this is a journey versus a destination? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Uh, Dr. King has definitely been uh, influential in my own life and in my own walk as an activist and organizer. I think about the times where I maybe get upset when something happens and I do my best to try to strike a balance um, you know, when I get frustrated, when I get upset and, um, I do have to go into prayer and meditation so that I don't just respond in anger, you know, when our community has been wronged or when I've personally been wronged, um, out on the front lines. I really love the example, uh, that Dr. King set of taking time to be still before God, processing information, and then a lot of times he used the power of his pen. You know, whether it was his um, 1963 um, letter from a Birmingham jail, or if it were, was the speeches that he wrote um, and how he translated the power of his pen through the power of his voice as one of the primary orators of his generation and our generation as well, um, those, examples that he taught are ones that I do my best to live by. And then also just thinking about this notion that not everyone has to agree with, um, with your perspective. Um, there are gonna be folks who disagree, folks who try to stop you, try to tear you down, but it's important to follow Dr. King's example of keeping our eyes on the prize 
and staying focused and continuing to demand the, the changes, the justice, the, the shift in laws and policies that our people need and deserve to see and to experience. Thank you for that. When you move forward in the racial justice network and as an attorney, um, you once again are at the forefront uh, and we need more black attorneys, more female. You've got an attorney in the White House, the uh, wonderful vice president. You've got uh, attorneys that are literally like yourself fighting forward and they've always been in the movement. What would you say to a young person thinking about studying and wanting to understand why a black lawyer is important to black lives? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the kind of conversation that I have with some of the young folks who participate in the movement. Some of them want to become lawyers and they ask me you know, about my experience of being a lawyer on the front lines and what steps would they need to take if they are interested in following a similar path. And so I always encourage them, if they're still in high school, get the best grades that they can, read as much as they can, and really take writing and research, research assignments seriously because they can uh, cultivate um, their strength as a good writer and a good researcher, which will serve them well if they decide to uh, go on to law school. But even going to college, those are important skills to have. And so that, that's the first thing I tell them, you know, get the best grades that you can. Also be well-rounded um, as, an, an, as an individual. And then, um, you know, write a very strong essay when they're writing to try to uh, get into college. And then I remind them that when you decide to go to college and you wanna become a lawyer, you don't have to major in any one set thing. I remember people encouraging me to major in political science. And I just said, you know, I'm not really excited by political science. So I majored in African-American studies, you know? And so I encourage them to find a major that they actually love, that they can do well in, and that'll build a foundation for, you know, when they do go to law school and ultimately become um, a practicing lawyer. And I let them know it's within reach, you know, not to listen to what society tries to say of who is and who isn't qualified to become a lawyer. You know, my family grew up in poverty in Mississippi and in uh, what's now called South LA. And so we didn't have a lot of resources, but at nine years old, by watching other lawyers on television, I knew that I wanted to become a lawyer. And that's just, I set my mind towards that goal. And even with obstacles along the way, I just persevered and God sent people who would encourage me or open a door for me or teach me. And all of those things played a role in me ultimately becoming a lawyer. So I let them know it's within reach that they can do it. And by them being out on the front lines and participating in demonstrations, I feel that they already have a head start because they're learning how to organize, they're learning how to mobilize people, how to use their voices, how to be persistent in the fight for justice. All of those tools are necessary to becoming a strong lawyer in the fight for justice. That moves me to a, a, a real MSP, very unique. The Twin Cities, very unique place for to be black. And, and by now they got an airport, so you could have left. You, you got a skill set, so you could have been hired away. Why do you stay on the forefront of a very um, awkward moment, not only in history, but just even in the future, uh, as you're working to create a new reality for Black people in you know, racial justice? Mm -hmm. Well, I moved to the Twin Cities in 2003. I took a job at the University of St. Thomas Law School to become a law professor there. And I was on the faculty for about 16 years. And um, during that time, there were times when I wanted to leave Minnesota. I said, listen, it's too cold and it's too white um, to remain in this environment. But literally, as a woman of faith, when I would pray, God would make clear that this was the place where that he planted me and I was not to leave. 
Um, and at one point, actually, more than a decade ago, God dropped into my spirit that this would become the next battleground for civil rights. And I remember telling people that and them thinking, you know, I've lost my mind, but I was very clear my spirit from what I heard from God, that I was not to go anywhere, that this would be the next battleground for civil rights, you know, and my assignment was here. And so I persevered, you know, and listened. And the next thing you know, we have the world watching what's happening in Minnesota, a place where many folks didn't even know Black people lived, you know, or where folks had believed the hype about uh, the Twin Cities being one of the most progressive places, uh, one of the best places, one of the most affluent places for people to live in this country. But what they didn't tell people was that that's for white folks, not Black folks who live in the Twin Cities because the exact opposite is true. But early on when I um, moved here and I was told all those positive things about Minnesota, what I started to see was that Minnesota was actually the Jim Crow North. And that our racial history here has been largely unexamined and it has contributed to a lot of the socioeconomic issues we face here, the racial disparities and the injustices. And so our activism and our fight is actually helping to expose a lot of those issues that have been lying beneath the surface for a very long time. And that has allowed Minnesota to literally get away with murder, uh, murder of Native Americans, murder of black folks. We even had a lynching here in, in Duluth, Minnesota of three black circus workers falsely accused of rape by a white woman. All of those things have been swept under the rug. But our work in the movement has helped to open the door to people being willing to examine these issues. So we have researchers coming out of the woodwork, looking at aspects of the history here. Uh, many folks don't know the Dred Scott case was a result of Dred Scott moving to Minnesota with his so-called master, living um, a free life, getting married. And when his master wanted him to leave, Minnesota, him deciding to sue. And that case, you know, there's some, um, some rhetoric that came out of that case by the Supreme Court Justice, um, Roger B. Tani. And um, he said in that case, the black man has no rights, which the white man is bound to respect. That to me is the foundation of how American jurisprudence sees black folks whether they acknowledge it or they don't, it's right there in the black letter of the law written by a Supreme Court justice. And that's how we're, we've typically been treated. So Minnesota is very much connected to African-American history. And I feel that our work is helping to make that much more visible. So that's why I'm here, just standing strong and doing my best to continue fighting. You know, when you think about that, thank you so much for that. When you, when you think about the movement here to see at the table, the economic uh, positioning of our community in Minnesota and racial justice and discriminating incidents, has it gone away with George Floyd or what are we living in now? Is this still an issue? Oh, it's absolutely still an issue. And I think that for folks who thought that what happened with George Floyd uh, and the conviction of the first officer, the main officer, who was involved in killing him would be the end of the story. I urge people to go back and recalibrate and to understand that it is one piece of the story and that accountability is something that we should celebrate, right? Because it's sadly, it's so rare to see police officers be held accountable when they kill people. They're typically allowed to kill people with impunity. And so we can't act as if that guilty verdict doesn't matter because the whole system itself hasn't changed. We have to acknowledge that that guilty verdict came about because number one, black blood was needlessly spilled. But number two, the people rose up and said, no, we're not gonna tolerate this. We want to see accountability and we're willing to take a stand by any means necessary. So that's something that we never maybe thought would happen in our lifetimes that we had an opportunity to witness. Um, and that's something that I hold near and dear to my heart in terms of seeing people actually rise up, actually fight uh, for us in the Twin Cities, but also 
to push for change within their own jurisdictions. But it's certainly not the end of the story. I mean, there have been many police killings that have happened um, after George Floyd was killed. Um, I anticipate there will be more because the system itself has not changed, not at the federal level, uh, not at many state levels and not at many local levels. And so we still have to keep pushing for federal changes, but at the same time, we have to roll up our sleeves, look in our own backyards and figure out what are the levers that we need to push and pull to demand change within these systems. And that includes policy changes, that includes leadership changes, that includes demanding accountability and not allowing these cases to be swept under the rug. When you think about the, you know, huge Fortune 500, uh, million and billion dollar corporations, if you had to sit down with three CEOs from three of the companies headquartered there in Minneapolis during Black History Month, um, who would you want to sit down with to talk about um, accountability, uh, discrimination, and racial equity and progress in Minneapolis. What three CEOs would you like to sit down with and why? I would want to sit down with the CEO of Target. Um, Target, of course, is a, a huge, massive uh, corporation. And um, a lot of Black folks, shop at Target <laughs> and a lot of our children want things from Target, right? And so I feel that the black community has played a huge role in, in the success of Target. And yet, you know, we need to see Target do much more um, to help uh, close the gap specifically for uh, lower income black folks. We know that there are sometimes opportunities, economic opportunities for middle-class and upper middle-class black folks, either who uh, work for Target, who wanna work for Target, or you know who are getting their products in stores. But sadly, even with all of the money that flowed you know, in Minnesota and across the country in the aftermath of George Floyd being killed, most of those resources did not trickle down to poor black people. And George Floyd himself would have been in that category as a low-income black man, and yet, those resources, resources have not um, trickled down to his peers or even you know, targeted, been targeted towards um, George Floyd's peers, not just from a racial, but again, racial and socioeconomic perspective. So I think that's a huge blind spot um, in terms of those companies that are vowing to do better. So I would like to see Target do better. Um, Let me ask you a question just in, in that, and this obviously is, is something that we can think about, but maybe when I hear you talking, obviously hanging out in North Minneapolis, would you imagine that based on the small percentage that you would want Minneapolis to say to any child that wanted to go to college, even an HBCU, that a CEO, the CEOs that you're talking about in Minneapolis would literally say, based on a small population, that any child, and they would now endow these HBCU Minneapolis scholarships to Morehouse Spellman, Howard Clark, uh, Bethune Cookman, Stillman, um, but really make it so that every child that was born, given the tragedy and calamity and loss of life um, that has happened, is that what you would want to see that there would be an, uh, a guarantee for those who have suffered given the, inner, the generational trauma that has occurred so that the young people wake up knowing that there is a Minneapolis scholarship for those children who have been there? Is that kind of what you're moving toward or, or that the executives, there's an executive rank uh, coming out of Minneapolis that is trained and grown from that as well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I do feel that every a black child who wants to go to college or university should have that opportunity available to them because resources are often a huge barrier um, for uh, black students who want to go on to college and get um, their bachelor's degree. Uh, and then you know, some may wanna go on to grad school as well, but at a minimum, being able to get a bachelor's degree um, is critical. Now, there are students who, don't wanna to go to college. 
And I, after going to college, after going to law school, I, I understand why someone would make that particular choice. And if that's the case, then we need to do more to open up um, opportunities for, for those young folks that pay a living wage if they wanna work for a company or corporation or organization or that wanna become entrepreneurs. There are a lot of young black people who are natural born entrepreneurs who know how to hustle, who know how to connect with customers on the streets and in their communities, but they don't necessarily have the infrastructure um, to be able to develop into full fledged business owners. But the studies show that black business owners are more likely to create jobs for black people. Right. And that's a way of helping to break some of these cycles um, that our community has been impacted by. So I would like to see, you know, various tracks, college, entrepreneurship, and then access to employment opportunities. Well, I, I guess following that same, we're in a let's just think about it. You're talking about business. What CEO uh, in, in business and finance would you want to sit down with? Of course, I would want to sit down with the CEO of U.S. Bank. Um, you know, U.S. Bank has put out uh, some, some statements and promises surrounding, um, you know, their push for equity. And they specifically put out statements in the aftermath of um, George Floyd being killed. And, um, you know, I've had, I had a chance to briefly speak with the CEO uh, last month, as well as uh, the vice president. Um, of U.S. Bank to talk about some uh, allegations of discrimination that happened in one of their branches. And during those conversations, uh, the vice president in particular, um, Greg Cunningham, shared with me some of the groundbreaking work that they are doing with regard to um, trying to close the gap for uh, Black developers, for example. Um, they also donated a branch uh, to a Black couple uh, who's doing good work in the community. But we talked about how do we ensure that those resources are able to benefit Black residents of North Minneapolis? Because again, Black folks in North Minneapolis are being left behind and left out of the conversation. And then how do we ensure that with all the good work that they are doing, that myself, that you know, people I know, that a young Black man wearing a hoodie can walk into a U.S. bank branch and be treated with dignity and respect. And if we, if that's not happening, then the good work essentially goes out the window because people care about how they're treated in everyday interactions inside of these institutions. Uh, I also believe that uh, U.S. bank can help close some of the gaps that have prevented home ownership in the black community. Right now we have about a 24, 25% home ownership rate compared to a 74 to 82% home ownership rate for white people in the Twin Cities. That's a huge, huge problem uh, because how can you stabilize communities if most of the folks aren't homeowners um, and they would like to be and they're forced to move every so often every time a landlord wants to raise the rent or decides that they want to do something else with the property. Those kinds of things help to exacerbate the problems um, within a low-income Black community. And we also need Black folks who are making a living wage, able to support themselves and their families. And then kids don't feel like they have to go out and hustle to help supplement their family's income. So I definitely think our financial institutions need to be at that table. They need to be listening. They need to be responding. Lastly, there, and I'm just going to throw them to you and you can share with me so that we can reach out to these folks for a seat at the table in February program uh, regarding MSP, Best of a Generation, which you'll be a part of. But literally, uh, Eco Labs and 3M, huge in the, the movie. What do we want? Are they maybe, maybe a rounded out kind of a uh, couple of, of individuals that we should reach out to and, and they play a role in uh, welcoming both black executives to move there, but also to invite the community inside. Is that maybe a corporation or, or one of those? Absolutely, that you like absolutely. absolutely. I, I think that those two corporations would be important um, to be at the table, especially because of their focus on science and technology. 
you know, STEM is, uh, you know, one of the areas, and now folks say STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, but there's a huge gap in our community as far as our young people being able to access science and technology and even to envision themselves in those types of careers, even though we're often using products from these companies as consumers. So there has to be a way to bridge the gap and to understand that our young people are more than capable of holding those kinds of jobs in the future, of being inventors, of being folks who help bring products to market that will advance and benefit the lives of black people. So yes, they need to be at the table. They need to make a stronger financial commitment, even for um, those young folks who wanna go to HBCUs, who wanna become scientists, who wanna become inventors. Um, Ecolab and 3M should be um, two of those companies helping to drive that type of uh, an initiative for our young people, not to mention technology. Because again, we're being uh, preyed upon as consumers, but denied opportunities um, from a business perspective. And that needs to change. I, I love that. Uh, I, I share that at Seat at the Table, we are receipt shareholders of most Fortune 500 companies. We are definitely receipt shareholders. And I think we need to be respected as receipt shareholders. Uh, clearly, uh, um, I love the time that we spent and I, I admire the conviction um, we have. Lastly, Fannie Lou Hamer is a dog. And clearly um, you are our new Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm sure you channel her and Dr. King probably having a three-way conversation on there. Uh, uh, between the two of them, should I left punch or should I lead down the street uh, um, at any moment? Um, I really wanna say thank you. Um, thank you for continuing to be there. I look forward to us doing more. Um, what's it like? What do you think young girls should know if they should and, and what else should Mattel do as it relates to not just providing a toy, but working with black female attorneys who are on the front line like yourself. What would your message be to Mattel and its CEO and the brand manager of these black dolls? What would you like to see differently? Uh, and how could we uh, and you participate in the marketing so that it's not a toy? This is a real person and she had a conviction. And if you play with her and even the white families that pick them up for their daughters, what should they know that they have in their hands when they're holding a Fannie Lou Hamer doll and what Fannie is channeling and should be saying to them at that moment? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as you just suggested, I, I love and admire Fannie Lou Hamer and her work. You know, she hails from Mississippi. I, you know, I'm an original um, resident of Mississippi, born and bred there, you know, for my uh, most of my early childhood and most of my family's still there. And so I think about Fannie Lou as a dark-skinned Black woman um, who didn't have a formal education, who was a sharecropper, and who, by faith, made the decision that she was going to stand up and fight uh, once she learned about uh, the opportunities that were out there to push for uh, voting rights for our people and to help our people understand the power of their vote, that it shouldn't be taken for granted and that we deserve access to everything that should come with our vote. Uh, and she got to the point where, you know, she was testifying in Washington and even the president of the United States during the time um, tried to silence her voice by holding a press conference at the same time as her testimony. And it caused the, the white media to say, wait a minute, what does this lady have to say that the president himself would try to disrupt her voice and the points that she's making uh, to hold a press conference? So she got even more press after that. Her message got out even further than it would have had the president not tried to silence her. So I would want uh, black girls to, to know and understand that they come from powerful black women, black queens, who spoke truth to power and let the chips fall where they may. And some of those black women who resolved to use their voices like Fannie Lou Hamer also suffered under the weight of oppression, being physically assaulted in a jail uh, simply 
because of her desire for change. And so that's the flip side of things that I think uh, young girls need to know, but not to run from that, not to be afraid of that, but to see the power in someone having uh, courage of their convictions and being willing to stand up in the face of oppression. And so those doll makers should understand that, that it isn't just about a toy. It is about translating the experience of the power of blackness uh, through an, an inanimate object like a doll, but what's being communicated through that doll, like the power, like the strength, like the story um, behind that person's legacy. And then words of encouragement, tools that uh, young girls can utilize um, so that they can move forward in a similar direction if that's what they choose to do or what they feel called to do. So can you imagine a line of dolls that feature powerful black women from the civil rights era and beyond? I haven't seen anything like that, but I would love to, and I would definitely buy those dolls uh, for my, my little girl who is uh, four and a half. Right. So that series is out. Um, they clearly uh, have it, her and uh, Catherine Johnson and a few others, but part of what I'm, I'm hoping is that with you, the, the curriculum of inanimate toys must have a curriculum. We can, they must meet. There must be a video series from individuals like you explaining the role of this inanimate object. Because there's clearly a, a, a siren that we have to have about consciousness, that this isn't a toy, this isn't a game, this is a commitment, this is a dedication. And I wanna say thank you so much, Sister Armstrong. Let us continue to move. I'm Munson Steed. I am hanging out with the dearest, true Fannie Lou Hamer Jr. Uh, Martin Luther King, King eloquent study, study of Thurgood Marshall uh, and all the other brothers and sisters who channel for freedom for Black people in and around the world. Um, Kima Armstrong, thank you so much for coming to see at the table. Uh, you do not have to be in the streets, everybody, but you do have to be in the struggle. I'm Munson Steed here to see at the table. Thank you so much. <music>